Welcome to your space journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration and the incredible leaders who are taking us there. Here's your host, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining us today for your space journey. We have an exciting episode today. We'll be speaking with Peter Beck, the founder and chief executive of Rocket Lab. But before we speak with Peter, we want to do our special segment about your space journey. This is where we share segments from our audience where they describe what drew them to the passion for space and what they're most excited about for the future of space exploration. And it's my privilege to introduce my friend, Philip Shane from What The If. I was fortunate to meet Philip earlier this year at a NASA social. Here's him telling his story for what drew him into space. Your space journey. Hi, I'm Philip Shane. I host a science and space podcast called What the If? And uh, I do that because I grew up watching Carl Sagan. And uh, I pursued science uh, and even uh, I interned at NASA for a number of years uh, when I was much younger. And inside wasn't my thing. I realized what I really wanted to do uh, was share the stories of the people who do it to the world that has never heard of them and should appreciate it. And there's a whole lot of people that don't appreciate even the fact that space is there. It's above everybody's head. Just look up. And I think they're afraid to. Um, so I grew up just w- with a serious passion for that through the Apollo missions, the space shuttle, all these things. And then I got invited to a NASA social event just recently. Um, it was the SpaceX Crew Dragon launch. It was the first time I ever attended a rocket launch in person at NASA and the thunderous roar at night and the blinding light and orange and red and white smoke billowing out from the rocket as it took off right in front of us into a sky full of stars. It was the most science fiction thing I've ever experienced. And I always knew this, but it just fully, even more magnified that sense of excitement, joy, passion, uh, thrill, just giddiness, <laughs> frankly, for uh, uh, an appreciation for living at this time, being able to share uh, what the people at NASA do in particular. And so we live in a golden age of space travel. And that's an amazing thing. Thanks so much, Philip, for sharing your story. I'll look forward to seeing you again in an upcoming launch. But now on to our future guest. It is my privilege to introduce Peter Beck. Again, Peter is the founder and chief executive for Rocket Lab. Since founding Rocket Lab in 2006, Peter has grown the company to become a globally recognized industry leader in space and a billion dollar company employing world-class engineers and technicians. Peter established Rocket Lab's Electron Orbital Launch Program in 2013. He also oversaw the development of the world's first and only private orbital launch range, located in New Zealand. Peter played a crucial role in establishing international treaties and legislation to enable orbital launch capability from New Zealand. That capability was realized in January 2018 with Rocket Lab's first orbital launch of the Electron rocket. I wanted to, to kind of go back a little bit. You just launched, uh, as of the time of this, As the Crow Flies, mm. and I believe that was your ninth Electron flight, and so far Correct. you've gotten 40 satellites launched so far. I just yep. want to say congratulations on this oh, thank you. success. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Oh, well, you've done a wonderful job. And one of the things that we love to, to ask is we love to find out sort of where the passion came from for mm. space. And I understand that as a teenager, you sort of developed an interest in powerful engines and mm-hmm. you wanted to build rockets growing up. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that passion began? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, for, look, as, for as long as I can remember, um, I was I was always fascinated by space. Um, you know, I would I would go out and look at the night sky and and just just sit there in, in awe and wonder. Um, and uh, you know, to boot, um, I, I loved engineering, so it was kind of the the the, the perfect marriage of, of two passions, really. And you know, I loved um, I loved the challenge of of uh, of building rocket engines. And you know, there's there's something about you know just harnessing that enormous energy and and controlling it, uh, and and using it to to achieve you know really cool things. It's I don't know. It's just I don't know. It's it's just really, really exciting. 
Well, I even heard that your high school counselor actually requested a meeting with your parents mm. because they were concerned that your dream was of uh, launching rockets, building rockets was absurdly unachievable. Is that true? Correct. No, that's, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, there's a local aluminium smelter that was down the road and I was very good with my hands. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the normal, normal kind of trajectory would have been, um, to, to, you know, to go to that aluminium smelter and, and, uh, and be a tradesman, um, which, which, you know, would have been a, would have been a fine, fine career, but just not something that, uh, not something that I'm interested in, in doing. There's obviously a lot of, uh, young adults out there and they have these um, dreams that some would consider crazy. What mm. advice would you give to someone for not holding back, for going for the dream? What advice would you give? Oh, I, I think that's an absolute must. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, the worst that can happen is you go and get a real job. Um, so no, I, I think, you know, it's, it's you know, the bigger the dream, the better as well. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I would just encourage anybody out there if they've got a true passion and, and something that they think they can, then can pull off, then, um, then just just go for it, and and there'll be plenty of people along the way that that won't think the same way that you do. But at the end of the day, um, you know what 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 have you got to lose? You got a very short time on this planet. Let's let's make it count. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. Now let's talk Rocket Lab. <laughs> mm. You founded it in two thousand six. By the end of two thousand nine, it became the first private company in the southern hemisphere to reach space. Mm. Now some of our audience might not be familiar with Rocket Lab. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what sets it apart from some of the others. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so I guess we were probably one of the early movers on, uh, you know, seeing that, that satellites were obviously going to shrink. And with a shrinking satellite, um, there would be a requirement for a, a launch vehicle that would, um, that would be able to service and deploy those satellites. So we, we officially started the Electron program in, in 2014 um, and started raising capital out of Silicon Valley and, and, and various institutions um, to, to, to develop uh, the Electron launch vehicle. And it's a small launch vehicle that's designed to lift small payloads into orbit, but really frequently to a number of trajectories and inclinations and altans, and really kind of open up, um, open up space for um, the small satellite who are typically, you know, you know, historically at least, been been kind of second class citizens on uh, on very large launch vehicles, ride sharing at the time or the pace or the orbit that the main, you know, the, obviously the main spacecraft wants to be wants to go to. So think of us, think of us is is like um, I really don't like using the same, but think of us like as as the Uber of space. So you have a very large bus, and that's fine if you want to jump on with a whole lot of folks and go somewhere. But if you just want to pick up your phone and get picked up at your door and dropped off at your door and in comfort, then then that's that's really um, that's really where we 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 excel. That is a great analogy too. I love that. And, and one thing I also love too is just the mission names themselves. The <laughs> yeah, one, yeah, yeah. You know, as the crow flies, look my no hands. My wife is in QA, so we loved. It's a test, still testing. Yeah, it's business time. <laughs> what led you and your team to develop such creative names for your missions? I love it. Well. I mean, look, this is an incredibly serious business where uh, there's just no room for any error. So this is about the one thing that you can actually just have a bit of fun with. Um, and it kind of reflects the, you know, the, the, the nature of the team here is, is we work incredibly hard. But, um, but also, um, you know, we, we like to have a little bit of fun now and again. And um, really, that was, that, that was kind of, um, you know, how we, how we were going to express ourselves through the, through, through the, through the naming conventions. And you, you mentioned Electron, of course. Now, I understand it's all carbon composite. Mm. Um, the Rutherford engine, if I understand right, is actually 3D printed. Correct. In about 24 hours per engine. Correct. Correct. You have revolutionized 3D printing. Can you tell us a bit more about that process and what led you to do this? Yeah, so for us, it's all about uh, manufacturability. So we, we, you know, we created a number of new technologies, not because we wanted to do something different. Um, it, we really looked for ways that we could solve big historical problems. Um, as you pointed out, it's an all-carbon composite vehicle. We did that um, simply because we're able to produce the tanks and the structures at a, at a, at a cost, efficiency, and scale using those techniques that we couldn't with um, aluminum. And then, you know, the Rutherford engine, when we first announced the Rutherford engine, uh, you know, it was, it was all 3D printed, electric turbo pumped. And, uh, you know, I think there were a lot of people in the industry kind of looked at us sideways because that was, that was at a time where, you know, that wasn't a very common thing to do. 
Um, so, you know, we've put over 90 of those engines uh, into space now. And, um, you know, the, the, everybody 3D prints some or most of their rocket engine these days. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the technology, you know, we really, uh, we really pushed the boundaries at the time. And um, we did that because, um, you know, there was no other way that we could produce engines at the quality, the performance and the flight rate other than uh, this, this, you know, additive, additive manufacturing techniques. Can you tell us a little bit more about the kick stage? What I understand, and I'm sure you can put this in, in a lot uh, better wording than I can, mm. is that the kick stage helps um, achieve that exact orbital trajectory yep. that they need, uh, even more circular than elliptical. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works? Yeah, so the kick stage is, is, is really a, it does a number of things. So firstly, it's, it's, uh, think of it as um, it's a very capable uh, third stage. Um, it has its own propulsion system, its own communication system, uh, you know, its, its own guidance system. And you, you're exactly right. It, it enables us to insert to orbital accuracies, which are almost unheard of within the industry, you know, some you know, kilometers or sub-kilometers of accuracy. Um, and, you know, the, the propulsion system is, you know, perfectly sized for those really, really accurate orbital insertions. But moreover, um, you know, we, we have a very strong commitment to the sustainable use of space. Uh, and for us, um, we weren't really comfortable uh, with leaving large portions of our launch vehicle on orbit. So the typical way you go to orbit is, you know, you go, you go into a transfer orbit with your second stage, then you relight your second stage, and you put your whole second stage into orbit, and then deploy your spacecraft. And, you know, orbital lifetime is a function of, you know, mass drag and altitude. So um, if, if you can remove some of those things, then, um, then you can shorten your orbital life. So what we do is we leave our second stage in, a, in an elliptical orbit, so we don't actually circularize with that second stage. Because we leave it in an elliptical orbit, you know, it deorbits in, you know, sometimes a matter of weeks, uh, and we don't leave anything behind. And then the kick stage, uh, as you correctly point out, circularizes the orbit, deploys the payload, and then because it's got its own propulsion system, we can deorbit that as well and leave nothing behind except the spacecraft. And, you know, for a company that, that, that kind of claims that they want to, you know, launch a lot, a lot of, you know, spacecraft, that seemed to us the only responsible thing to do. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And what I understand is sort of an evolution of the kick stage is where Photon uh, exactly. satellite platform comes along. And I, you had some news recently where I believe you have an extended range now, which includes the lunar vicinity. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that announcement. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the, it always used to frustrate me that um, you know I had I had a, a launch vehicle that had basically the same equipment as the satellite that I was flying, and my launch vehicle became a satellite for a number of hours um, while I was deploying my my customer's payload. And it just seems such an incredible waste. Um, why could we not turn that into a spacecraft in its own right? and then allow people just to focus on building the sensor, building the payload, rather than actually having to, to build their own spacecraft. So that, that, that bore, bore the evolution of, of the Photon spacecraft bus. And, um, you know, as, as we've continued to involve that, that spacecraft bus, we've kind of realised some of its capability. And, um, you know, with some small modifications, we can, uh, we can really, uh, you know, do some incredible missions with that, and, as you say, including uh, deliver small payloads to, to lunar orbit. When other thing that I was really impressed about this year, Peter, is um, you gave a presentation that talked about just how, as an engineer, uh, you, you spoke of this in photon, you don't want to throw away anything, and you're moving towards plans for reusing electrons Correct. at first stage. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that re uh, reusability plan. Yeah, so uh, actually Flight 10, which is which is on the pad now, is is a really big milestone for us. Um, so Flight 10 is a block upgrade. It has a full guidance suite on board, telemetry suite. Uh, it also has reaction control system on board, so little rocket engines that will orientate the stage for re-entry. And this is really our first, uh, you know, foray in, into, uh, you know, re-entry deep into the Earth's atmosphere. So um, we'll learn a lot from this mission, um, and we'll learn how close we are, how far away we are, but... Um, Basically, everything's on this stage except for the aerodynamic decelerators. So we won't be trying to put it under a parachute. We won't be trying to capture it. Um, we'll just be pushing it a deep and fast into the atmosphere to gain as much knowledge as we can about the environment to feed back into our models. You know, that's one thing I think you explained really well, too, is because of the size of your spacecraft, it's, it's not even, uh, it doesn't make sense. It's not physically, mm. I don't know if it's possible to return um, to the launch pad using all that fuel. So you, by exactly. capturing in midair, which I think is uh, brilliant, I think that's just a wonderful uh, idea to, to make the reusability rockets. 
Yeah, we, we, were, we were tasked with a very difficult um, approach here. And, and for a long time, I believed that it was not possible to, to recover a small launch vehicle um, because the environment that you have to push through, you know, we've got to go from eight and a half times the speed of sound to, you know, 0 0.01 times the speed of sound in around about 70 seconds. So that, that's, a, that's a tough thing to do. Um, and so for a long time, we didn't believe that that was, that was achievable. Um, but as we started to fly and capture data, um, we, learned, we learned more and more and, and got ourselves you know, comfortable along with developing new technologies that we, we believe um, you know, are going to provide that solution. But yes, I mean, it is, uh, it is, it is a, quite a different approach. Um, if we were to use propulsive landing um, that, that, you know, that, that others have demonstrated, uh, we would take a small launch vehicle and turn it into a medium-sized launch vehicle. And we're not in the business of building medium-sized launch vehicles, um, so it was, is you know, some things scale well and some things don't, and that was just one thing that didn't scale well. Well, that just makes so much sense, and I cannot wait uh, to see as as that happens in the future. It's going to be incredible. Now, Rocket Lab is just doing some incredible growth, and one of the things that you're doing now, I believe, is you're building your second launch complex on Correct. Wallops Island. I was wondering, how is that going? Can you tell us more about that? Well, look, this this is, I think, uh, words fail me for how impressed I am at, at, at the team, both the Rocket Lab team, the Mars team, the Virginia team, at how quickly that launch site has come together. So, you know, we started driving piles in February, and it's going to be activated and certified for flight in December. Uh, and there's a lot of concrete and a lot of infrastructure that had to be built there. Um, so uh, I, think, I think we redefined how quickly you can build a launch site. Um, we certainly know that... Um, uh, that that all all the team uh, there in, in in Virginia have never seen something built been built so quickly, uh, but you know it's 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 uh, it's a real testament to um, to a great collaboration that we're able to push that out of the ground that fast. Well, that's incredible. But I've heard you say just how immense of a project that was of yeah. building a launch. <laughs> it's no easy feat. It is. It is really not. It is. Yeah. People underest. I think people underestimate the ground infrastructure on launch a lot. It is, it is, it's, it's, it's like building a mini city in some respects. It's just crazy. Now, Peter, I, I, we're so excited for you on that. Given just space in general and how it's going, where do you see, I, I guess, the future of space exploration going? Where would you like to see it, say, five years down the road looking back? What does Rocket Lab look like? Yeah, I think the, the definition of success for us will be that um, we're flying incredibly frequently. Photon is a platform that is, is just a very prolific platform that, that enables you know, a much lower barrier to entry to the market. So someone with a, a concept or an idea can just get on orbit and provide a service. Uh, I think if, if we can get to that point, then the world becomes a very different place. I think you know, if space is truly opened up for um, you know, commercial influence and, and, and government, um, government you know, needs, then I think um, I think everybody's life down on this on this planet's gonna gonna look vastly different. That's wonderful. Well, Peter, again, congratulations to you and your team. We're just so excited about the future for Rocket Lab. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join me today. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much for your support. Your space journey. Wow, I really enjoyed my conversation with Peter today. Hope you did too. If you'd like to learn more about Rocket Lab, just go to their website at rocketlabusa.com. I want to thank Peter for joining us today. I also want to thank Philip Shane for sharing his space story earlier in the episode. If you'd like to share your space story with us, less than two minutes, please, we would love it if you'd leave us a voicemail at 317-862-4700 or email us your audio or video clip at info at yourspacejourney.com. You can also help us by sharing this episode with a friend or rating us on your favorite podcast application, such as Apple Podcasts, or if you're watching on YouTube, just give us a like and comment there too. We'd appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule for joining us today. We'll see you next time. God bless.